All right, welcome on in everyone. Welcome back. This is our second naturalist night of the year. Um, tonight, I am excited to introduce Bob Allen. Bob is a biologist, photographer, and educator locally here. He's also the author of Wildflowers of Orange County. And he's here tonight to talk to us about plants and pollinators, specifically native plants and their pollinators. Um, Bob is willing to and happy to take your questions as uh, the presentation goes along. So feel free to type those into the chat or you can use the raise your hand feature and we'll call on you. Um, and I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Bob. Welcome on. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, everybody. How is everyone? You can talk, I don't bite. Oh, we get thumbs up, that's good, that's good. I see that Peter guy, that troublemaker, right over there, right over there. And I see there's a wonderful person right behind him too. Hi. Hey, Portia. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, well, as she mentioned, uh, I, I like to do talks as more of a discussion, kind of a chat, you know, informal. So if you have a question or clarification during the talk, just kick right in. You can unmute and say something or, or, or digitally raise a hand, whatever you want to do, and we'll, we'll talk about it. All right, so let me go ahead and share a screen and get on over there and start this up now zoom sometimes does not play nice with digital presentations so i need to know can you see uh, a flower moving on the screen i, I can. can yes thank you very much okay let's see now here's the problem zoom has sometimes is when you go next it sometimes doesn't go next for you but it does for me but that looked like an interesting daisy you had up there yeah it is a very interesting daisy which is on the <laughs> I put it on the final exam of all my classes, and the answer, the question is, what's the most beautiful flower in all of California? And there's only one answer. Alan's Daisy. That's right. See, Peter got it right. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to talk about pollination and pollinators and some of the uh, mechanisms from for our some of our local plants. I could turn this into a 20-hour talk. As Peter knows, I could do it. Um, so I had to kind of really pick and choose some things to go over because there's just some really cool stuff going on. So we're going to define pollination so you understand what's going on with that. And that pretty much summed it up right there with that little animation. So let's move on. All right. Can you see this? See the cover of the book? Is it still working? Miriam, I see I you talking, see. but I don't hear anything. I oh, can good. see okay. the cover. Yes, we can see the book. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Well, I have to ask my students all the time because sometimes Zoom stops working in the middle of my classes. Anyway, there's the book. I'm going to move on. Okay, so a little overview. Why pollinators? Why would we want to look at that? Well, let's define that and let's have an understanding of pollination. Let's appreciate the diversity of pollinators. There's all kinds of different kinds. And then let's look about look into attracting and gardening for some pollinators, how you can bring them into your home or school or business or neighborhood. There's lots of ways to do that. Now, I like to start off with this photo. It's one of my favorite photos I've ever taken. And <clears throat> these are some bees hanging out on weeds mariposa lily uh, from the Santa Ana Mountains. This is um, Lazy W Ranch Road, where this plant's pretty common. It's not a rare plant at all. It's not super common, but it's not listed rare. And these wonderful bees are here in the middle. They're standing on the reproductive parts of this nice flower, and they're mating. All right. But if you look carefully in the upper left corner, somebody's watching. So I call this photo the voyeur. All right, so pollination gets kind of racy. All right, so pollinators. There are 4,000 native, uh, native bee species just in North America. There's 20,000 different bee species in the world that we know of, 4,000 native to North America. 
about 70% of all bees nest in the ground and most are solitary. Almost all of those 70% nest all by themselves. One bee makes a nest, takes care of the young, and that's it. They're not in a big hive. So think about the typical knowledge about a European honeybee. That's usually the bee people know the best. It's not from here. Thinking that represents all bee biology is like thinking that an English dandelion represents all plants in North America. And we know it doesn't. And it too is not native here. All right. So about 25% of bees in the world face risk of extinction because of human intervention, because of things we do. We develop land, we mine, we cut roads and plant, we put things, you know, we change everything. And we've really messed it up. And we have crashed the bee populations. Bees are major pollinators. That's why kind of a focus on, on them. So bees and other pollinators are essential elements of healthy environment. They are declining, sadly. Around 85% of all flowering plants, including most of our crops, need a pollinator to reproduce. So we're going to talk about what that is. And as much as a third of our food supply relies just on bees, just on bees, a third of our food supply. And then uh, pollinators are the heart of resilient ecosystems, right? Because a habitat really is begun by plants, and then that provides habitat, and that brings in all of the life forms, Everything really depends on those plants. If the plants can't reproduce, which is the big deal about pollination, right? the, if, the, if some of the uh, pollinators are gone, plant can't reproduce, the plant goes down and the habitat goes down. So it really is a cascading effect. We need to understand flower parts in order to understand pollination because flowers are the reproductive organs of plants and they've got very definite parts. So we're just gonna go through this rather quickly. We have a place where the stem and the flower uh, meet, where the, the stem, we say the, flower, the, the stem receives the flower. So it's called the receptacle for receiving. We have sepals, which form a structure called the calyx. We have a petal, which is part of the structure called a corolla. We have an anther, which contains pollen grains. And we have a filament, which is the stalk of the of the uh, structure, together they make up the stamen, which is the male part of a flower. And then over here we have the stigma and the style and the ovary, sometimes called a carpal, depends on the structure of the, of the uh, plant. And this ovary contains ovules, just like in animals. And there's the pic a drawing of the ovules. That female part is called the pistil. A plant can have one pistil with a simple ovary. It can have a simple ovary with multiple pistils. It can have actually multiple ovaries in the same flower. It's a huge variety here. Okay, and then down here, kind of like a donut under the ovary is a structure called the nectary. Now the nectary can be in many different places. I drew it underneath the ovary because that's the most common place. Things like yucca, have the ovary on the out, sorry, have the nectary on the outside of the ovary. Some plants have it on the style. Some have it next to the stigma. Some have it on the petals, like mariposa lilies that we just saw. Some have it on the sepals, some have it on the stem, some have it on the leaves. So they can be in many, many different places. So in terms of what pollination is, we've got our flower here. The first part called pollination is moving the pollen to the stigma. So watch this fancy animation here. Boop, there we go. All right, that pollen has now landed on the stigma. Pollen sticks to the stigma. That's why how you remember what the stigma does. Pollen sticks to the stigma. And that's the first step. Pollination is now done, but it hasn't helped the plant yet. That pollen needs to grow a tube that goes down the center of the style and makes it to the ovary and makes it to the ovules. And these two sperm cells need to follow down through that tube that's gonna grow and make their way to the ovule where the two sperm cells get together with the ovule and have a double fertilization. This is in flowering plants, they have a double fertilization. So it's two sperm cells for every one new plant that's going to form. It grows a pollen tube, which I drew in as a blue, and then fertilization is the union of sperm and ovule, which forms a zygote, that's a one-celled new individual, 
that's going to grow into an embryo that's going to be inside of a seed that's going to germinate form a new plant and that's reproduction which continues that species all right so going all the way back pollination is simply that process of getting the pollen to the stigma and there's lots of ways to do that here are some monkey flower uh, pollen tubes this yellow here with the three little areas of weakness that's one grain of pollen a unit of pollen is called a grain there's one up here all these yellow ones have been falsely colored yellow in this uh, electron microscope shot they're all yellow these black and white ones down here that's the surface of the stigma so this pollen is stuck to the stigma and then the next thing that happens is that this pollen grain grows this tube see the yellow tube going down it grows that tube and goes down in through the center of the style and then two sperm cells leave the pollen grain and travel through that tube, making their way to the ovule. All right, there are lots of ways that pollen gets places. And we're gonna look at these pollen vectors as they're called. And we can really look at the big ones here. Beetles are probably the first pollinators ever. Flies are important pollinators. Butterflies and moths are surprisingly not very efficient pollinators. There are actually very few plants pollinated by butterflies and moths. Ants, wasps, and bees are all important pollinators, and so are hummingbirds. Now, in our area, the list ends here. But if you go out in the desert or in tropical areas, bats and other species of birds are also important pollinators. But locally, really, the hummingbirds do the bulk of the bird pollination. Our first group are the beetles, because as we know, the beetles have done more than their fair share of pollinating over the years. And then we have the other beetles. These are examples of some beetles from Majeska Peak. Actually, I took Peter up to this spot um, years ago. And they have chewing mouth parts. They eat the pollen, but they get pollen on their body. They accidentally spread it to the flowers. They're kind of clumsy because they wander all over. Imagine those beetles in the picture moving around, wandering. Let me move my microphone a little bit more. OK. And um, they just transfer pollen that way. See, pollination is not an intentional thing for almost all insects. It's a completely incidental thing. So they're normally on flowers that are kind of flat or bowl shaped, face up, white, whitish, pale yellow. See, beetles don't really care about a lot of color. They usually have a strong odor of fruit or perfume. There we go. And um, these are some examples. These are actually really little longhorn beetles that live on the top of the peaks locally. They don't get down low where we are, but I really like them. They're really pretty. Okay, here's an example of a beetle. This is a blister beetle from Santiago Canyon, and you can see the little grains of yellow pollen all over the beetle. So it just wanders around on the flowers, feeding on some pollen, feeding on some petals, and carries pollen all over the place accidentally touching the pollen to the female part, the stigma of some of the flowers. All right, this is another blister beetle that's really uncommon. I was very lucky to find this guy. <clears throat> I don't find this one very often. This is a, a type of blister beetle whose mandibles have formed, I'm sorry, maxilla of this, have formed a tube just like butterflies have. And you can see in the drawing at right, you can see the mandibles in front, you can see the maxillae in the back, and they're held together and they form a tube. So this thing feeds on things like California buckwheat. That's what it's on here. Puts the tube down to the nectary and drinks the nectar. In the process, gets pollen all over itself, wanders around and transfers the pollen to the stigma of other flowers. Bob, we do have one hand raised. Um, oh, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. Janet, would you like to? Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Um... Sorry, my question related to the mic, uh, the the photograph of the microscopic pollen and those tubes, um, the right before, right there. So would would, and you said it was a microscope, but would we ever be able to see uh, if we are looking at a flower and see uh, the pollen and maybe that tube, or is it just too tiny? You can see the pollen with the naked eye, but better yet, a hand lens, right? I, I always have a hand lens with me, right? So you should have a hand lens of some kind. Uh -huh. You can see the pollen grains really easily with a hand lens, and you can see those pollen tubes growing, but not well with a hand lens. It's really better with a compound microscope, even on the lowest setting on a compound scope. 
you can see it, but it, they're just so skinny that that hand lens isn't quite going to do it. Okay. Yeah, I was just cu curious. This is the first I've heard about the tubes, but that's why I'm at at, the, at your lecture. Oh, great! Thank you, Janet. <laughs> yeah, there, it's kind of a standard uh, botany lab thing where you you get a microscope slide and you put on some sugar water and you drop um, you drop some pollen on it and the pollen often responds just to the sugar water and will start growing a tube but even Ooh. better you go to a flower and you clip off the stigmas of, of a flower drop it on the on the sugar water and mix it, crush it a little bit and then you get some pollen of the same species and you dust it on there and it'll start growing pollen tubes just randomly oh, and they're interesting yeah, they're easy to see even on low power on a compound microscope. But again, a hand lens just isn't quite good enough to see them. And it's helpful if you stain it uh, red too. There's a red red stain we use. Okay, thank you for a question. I'm sorry I missed it. I, I I'll I'll be better about looking over. Oh, uh, there's Bettina. Hey, Bettina, you have a question? Hey Bob. Hey. Yeah, I do have a quick question. This is an electron microscope image, isn't it? Not yeah, a, I, keep, I keep an electron microscope with me whenever I go in the field. I've, I've seen you. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your microscope. Anyway, it's not electron. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that is an EM shot. I wish it were mine, but it's not. I've never, I've used EMs before, but I never shot pollen with them. <clears throat> okay, let's catch up there where we were. There and over here. Okay, we did a beetle. We get this guy. We're on to that beetle, and we're on to this one. All right, who's seen this guy? Isn't he cool? He's very cool. Okay, this is a green fruit beetle. Very often, people change the common name to match whatever fruit they see them eat. Like some people call them a fig beetle when they're on their figs, or peach beetle, or you know whatever. Anyway, green fruit beetle is a better generic name for it. And there it is at San Joaquin Wildlife Sanctuary feeding on the flowers of coastal golden bush. I didn't put it there. I was hiking through there and there it was feeding on flowers and pollen of coastal golden bush. So it is a pollinator. Um, and there he is, nice big old scarab beetle. I know some people call it a Japanese beetle. It is not. Japanese beetles are very small. A Japanese beetle could ride on this part of the body of this beetle. The whole body of a Japanese beetle would fit right there. That's how small they are. And they are not here. They're not here. Okay, so green fruit beetles move on. Flies. Oh, flies are such important pollinators. Yep. So they like shallower tubular flowers, flowers that face up or out. They don't care about the color, but they like a smell. They like a nice strong scent. It can be fruity or perfumey or even smell like dead animal. Three flies, fleet that three fly families are the primary pollinators in our area. The flower flies, that's our number one pollinator. This is an example of a flower fly. Bee flies, which are a fly that look and sound like a bee, and but they're young, are parasites or predators of native bees that nest in the ground. And then parasitic flies whose young are internal parasites of other insects, but the adults are really important pollinators. Pretty wild, huh? Okay, this is a species of flower fly on one of the baccarus plants and it's just covered in pollen, right? It's just covered. Because of the mouth parts of this fly, it's probably after nectar and not so much pollen. It just got pollen all over it. But as it moves around, it's going to transfer the pollen to other flowers. And I have to ask this, because some people go, ooh, you flies? Especially when I do this in person, I get a lot of reactions. Ooh, flies? Ooh, what are you talking about flies for? Wait a minute. You don't like flies? How can you not like flies? You're basing that on the flies that like trash or dead bodies or that fly in your face. Well, those aren't pollinators. So consider this about flies. There's a plant called cacao, Theobroma cacao. It's in tropical South America, and it looks like this. My gosh, it's a beautiful plant. There's its flower, its fruit. You open the fruit, looks like this. You get in and you take out the beans and you make that stuff with it. Yeah, it's that. 
Well, you might ask, what pollinates this thing? It is a little bitty fly called a chocolate midge. Now, you want to really appreciate this. This fly is so small that in insect collections, we can't put a pin through it. We have to put we have to put a pin through a piece of paper and glue the fly to the paper. In fact, in the background, you see that that blurry thing going up at this angle. That's an insect pin in the distance. It's glued to this paper. This fly is about three millimeters long. They're really small. That is the only pollinator of cacao. Without that fly, you have no chocolate. So I think now you might appreciate flies a little better. That's a really important fly. Okay, and here's one from Casper's Park on um, Goldfields. What a gorgeous thing, huh? I was being interviewed by Pat Brennan from the Register, and uh, we're going around Casper's, and he's recording and photographing and videoing and all this stuff. And there was this beautiful fly on Goldfields right there. I said, wait a minute, I got to photograph this. And I got this shot of this beauty. Just a beautiful little fly. That is a flower fly. They kind of look like bees. The adults are always on flowers. The young eat aphids. So if you're a gardener, you know, hey, anything that eats aphids is your friend. These are great flies. Okay, a couple more flower flies. Here's one called stripe-eyed fly because it's got these weird stripes on it. And there it is on Bacchus. Here's another kind of flower fly, hairy flower fly, also on another kind of Bacchus. I think they were on the same plant the same day, actually. Flies are really common pollinators. They're really important pollinators. Here is Ceanothus. I was over at Tree of Life Nursery. I'm sure you know where that is. Bettina, you have a question for you, for me? Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I That stripe-eyed fly, is that local? Is that a native or is that from Spain? The stripe-eyed fly is local. It's all over this country, but it's not native here. It is native to Europe. Okay. It was accidentally Thanks. brought in many years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, as a lot of things have been brought in. So do you call that native then or do you call it naturalized? It's naturalized. Yeah, it's, it's not native. Okay. So, so Bob, before you move on, this is Janet. I have a question about the prior fly that had the young, that had the aphid, that, that they would eat aphids. How do you attract this fly to your yard? Oh, that's really easy. All you have to have are plants that have aphids. Oh, well. <laughs> that's all you need. So, if so you not a particular flower that, that could be nice, you know, that you could have along with your aphid plants. No, they, uh, the, the, female, the female adult can actually smell aphids. And so she'll oh, fly around okay. and she'll, she'll find aphids and she'll lay her eggs among the aphids. And okay. her young, now the young of a fly is called a maggot, all right? So it's young, it's not the prettiest thing to our eye. It's kind of a <laughs> light gray usually, or a light brown color. And it crawls on the stem feeding on the aphids. It's kind of gross to watch them. They actually have two hollow pieces of uh, hollow hooks and they'll find an aphid and they just and just drink them dry and throw the shit the body shell away it's really it's really brutal. Yeah, it's brutal. interesting yeah bob i have a question too um okay, okay. Hi, this is rita um on the stripe eyed fly since it's not native does it edge out our native uh pollinators uh, I would have to say yes, because in many cases, when things are competing for resources, somebody's going to be the loser. So anytime there's a non-native organism, it's going to be taking resources that really belong to the native organisms. So there's nothing we can do about that with these European species? And no, it's firmly entrenched here. It's like getting rid of European honeybees. They're also non-native, right. but they escaped from cultivation and... It, it just, it wouldn't, it would not be a good thing to try to get rid of them. We would spend billions of dollars and we'd have to continue doing it every year. Just like this thing, we'd have to spend a lot of money. They're just everywhere. Is it hurting um, the, the balance or anything that the native bees and the native flies are, are not here? Well, it's, it's not a documented thing with this species. There are, you know, there's about a million species of insects that we know of. And we just haven't studied them all. There's just not enough money to pay people to go study 
everything. So as far as that species of fly goes, I, I don't know of any studies done on it at all. So yeah, it could be stealing pollen and, and or nectar that native species would need. And that, that does happen with non-native species. It's just another reason why we do need to inspect everything coming in and educate people that they shouldn't bring more. Yeah. But every time people travel, they just want to get away with stuff. And you know they bring non-natives here all the time. So do you think there's room for everybody? No, I don't. OK. <laughs> uh -uh. Darn it. Thank you. Sure. OK, so this is a Ceanothus at Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano. This is one of the flower flies. It's got really weird antenna. And uh, there it is feeding on Ceanothus. So it is a good pollinator of Ceanothus. And that one is native. OK, this is a bee fly. This is a native bee fly. This is our biggest one. This guy is a monster. And they look like a bee. They sound like a bee. But they're not a bee. Of course, they don't have a stinger. Bees, bees typically have stingers. Not all bees, but some bees, most bees have stingers. This thing actually has a mouth part that's a tube. So picture putting a drinking straw in your mouth and you could only eat what you could pull up through that straw. That's what this guy does. So all bee flies do that. They put the proboscis into a flower and they'll drink up nectar if that's what they want, but they'll also put the straw up to the, the anther and suck in pollen. It's kind of wild. And so they get pollen all over their hairy body. They transfer the pollen to uh, other flowers. They're very important pollinators. Because they make a buzzing sound when they fly, people often think they're bees and they'll swat at them or try to get rid of them. And that's not a good idea. They're fantastic bees and they're very pretty. Some really good color forms of these. Some are little, most are big. And then we come to the butterflies and the day flying moths. So they have a tubular proboscis that coils up under the head. They can unfurl it and put it into a flower and drink nectar. They don't eat pollen. They just drink nectar and they drink water from puddles, things like that. So they need a tubular flower to drink from. They won't be at a little flat flower usually. Flowers normally face upward or outward. They are attracted to bright colors. So blue, yellows, reds. Uh, sweet scent is normally what brings them in. They could follow that scent in and then use visual cues to get closer. But the thing about butterflies and day flying moths is most of them have limited pollination success. They are not a major pollinator, but there are specialty pollinators of some plants. All right. And I think I might have some of that coming up, but I, I can't remember if I got it in here or not. These are pale swallowtails. These are on the Holy Jim Trail my favorite trail in the Santa Ana Mountains. Uh, butterflies really like purple flowers, even pale purple like this guy. Here is our state butterfly. Some guy took this top photo, I forgot his name, but it's such a great photo that every, every field guide seems to license that photo from him. <laughs> and then um, the bottom two are mine. They're both uh, side shots of our state butterfly, the California dog face taking nectar from thistles. It's their favorite nectar source. First, they like purple flowers and they like thistles a lot. I just staked out some thistles in the Santa Ana Mountains, put my camera on a tripod and just waited. And the male on the left shows up, photographed him, takes off. Female on the right shows up, photographed her, she took off. All right, just beautiful you stuff. You never get them to open their wings though. Yeah, I think, I don't know what Peter did there. I think maybe he uh, he had a spicy burrito and breathed on it or something. I don't know. I don't know how he got it to open up its wings, but they don't normally do that. They normally sit with their wings closed. So either he got lucky or or that or that breath. Maybe it was that. How do you tell male from female? Well, the top center is a male, and that's the left one with the wings shut. Can you see all the dark on the forewing there? I'll teach you to, to find the dog, all right? So let's just look at the top left wing only. Ignore the rest of the butterfly. The top left wing, the black is the background, just like I have black behind me, okay? And so it's facing here. You can see its eye, all right? The eye of the dog. Here's its forehead up here. And then it's got a long snout. And it's got, its chest is down here. It's kind of smiling. All right, and then its ear is at the base of the wing. 
So you're seeing it in profile on the left wing and then a mirror image on the right wing. Now look down at the male with its wings closed, lower left, and you can see the outline of the black on the wing, even though the wings are shut. Females don't have those markings. So look at the female, you see the light coming through? You can see there's no black on the wing. Once you know that, you can actually tell if it's a male or female when they're flying. It's not that hard to tell. That black is a lot of black. And then also, right after they emerge from the chrysalis, they have a blue kind of ultraviolet looking tinge to this part of the wing that goes away with age. So for the first few days they're flying around, they've got that purple tinge. Man, they're beautiful. Just a beautiful butterfly. And it's our state butterfly. What a great choice. Really great butterfly. Okay, this was at Tree of Life Nursery. These are California tortoise shells, which is not a common butterfly in our area at all. I was lucky to find two of them on, on this shrub. And you can see the proboscis on the left one going down and then back up. The plant it's on is, uh, Calif is Baja California uh, birdbush, Ornithostaphylos, and it's a member of the plant family that has flowers that hang down. And anything that has flowers hanging down, well, to get to the nectar or the pollen, you've got to be upside down. So butterflies will typically land on the plant upside down, have the proboscis so down and back up. The one on the right is searching around with the proboscis, but it's at the wrong angle. So it's not going to get anywhere till it turns around. And it, it, it did later. All right. These guys don't do any pollination on these plants. They simply take the nectar and they don't transfer any pollen. These are painted ladies. This is from the same huge uh, painted lady emergence a couple of years ago that just went crazy. There they are on the same Ceanothus I showed a minute ago at Tree of Life Nursery. And we have two painted ladies having lunch together with their proboscis going into Ceanothus. As they walk around, they do get pollen on their legs. And because the, the stigma, the female part, is, is right next to all the stamens, when they get pollen on their legs or their body, it does get transferred to the, to the uh, stigma as they move around. So they can do pollination when the plant has the stigma sticking out like this, and they get pollen moved around. So they're not pollinators of that bird bush we just saw, but they can be pollination, pollinators of this Ceanothus. However, with Ceanothus, beetles and flies are much more effective pollinators uh, and, and bees. All right, every year on my birthday, I go off somewhere alone. I like to go up in the Santa Ana Mountains. This was a shot on my birthday. Oh my gosh, 10, 15 years ago, I was up and I'm chasing this Western Snowberry Clearwing Moth all over the place. And you chase them slowly, otherwise they'll split. So this one was there hovering and the action of it and the wind it generated disturbed all of these other insects that were lower down in this thistle. Now, this moth is not a pollinator of this plant. It's not touching the parts, so it can't really be a pollinator. However, all these little insects are major pollinators of this thistle and other plants. In the center, you see a little tiny native bee. On the ends of the other flowers, mostly curving to the left, you see little soft-winged flower beetles that are covered in pollen. And they are very important pollinators of many, many species of plants. And- Bob, are you willing to talk about your equipment? I mean, your photographic equipment? Uh, sure. You know what I use. You've been with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, other people might. Uh, oh, be okay. In that. So I use a, I use a Canon EOS uh, DSLR, or right now I'm using a, the Canon EOS R5 mirrorless uh, single lens reflex camera with a hundred millimeter macro lens and a dual flash or a single flash, depends on what I need. Sometimes I'll use a 180 macro, which is long, and a big flash. Uh, sometimes with a diffuser on the flash, and I have to chase them around a lot. You really can't do this kind of photography on a tripod. I was staking out the dog faces. I was able to do tripod there because I'm just looking at one flower. Um, but this was handheld. This rig is pretty heavy, so I'm moving around all the time. And after a while, you just get really tired because it's, it's kind of heavy. I'm shooting mirrorless now, which does weigh less. So that's been very helpful. Thank you. All right, sure. 
Uh, Peter and I have been up on the peaks photographing together, not as much as we'd like because we're both just busy, uh, but it's really fun. Uh, we both really love photography. Someday Peter will get the hang of it. Okay. And then, wish this is my photo, it's not. It's my friend Terry Hunnefeld. Um, here is a Hylies lineata, a uh, white line sphinx in Anzabrago. Oh, I can't believe this photo. One of my favorite desert plants and a really nice moth that hovers just like it's the same family as the one we just saw. But this one has pollen on the proboscis. I can see it where it in, goes into the flower. So it is able to do pollination, but only if the proboscis with the pollen hits the stigma. That's the only way you get pollination. But there is pollen on its proboscis. So these can be pollinators. And there are some species that are adapted to just be pollinated by these. Okay, and then we come to bees, all right? Bees have biting mandibles. Bees can bite you, and they have a tongue behind the, behind the mandibles. They eat nectar. That's what they want to feed on. They don't eat pollen. They collect pollen to bring it back to their nest to feed to their young. Almost all bees do that. They do that because they're covered in hairs. Bumblebees have branched hairs, so they're really good at picking up pollen. All the other bees have straight hairs. And a couple families, or sorry, one family of bees has no hair at all. So they don't even collect pollen at all. All right, they generally go after all kinds of colors except not pure red. Bees cannot see red. Insects see an ultraviolet. And red and ultraviolet is black. So an all red flower, a bee is typically going to skip it. Unless that flower produces a lot of really nice smelling scent, like a real strong perfume, then the bee can detect it and it will not pay attention to visual cues. It'll just follow its nose. All right. And they're really important pollinators. We have several species of bees here, a lot. Um, we have no complete inventory of how many bee species are in our area, uh, but studies have, have easily picked up 400 species here in our area. There have been some studies in San Diego County where they've picked up even more. They're closer to another country, so they get some of their species coming up. All right, and then we have the European honeybee. It's also called Western honeybee. On the left, we see one on um, telegraph weed, which you do have in the bay. And it's collecting pollen, and it collects the pollen and packs it into this little basket on the hind leg. Next to that, um, telegraph weed down low down by my feet was this plant which is uh, croton sediger it's um i'm terrible with common names uh, it is california croton that's it and it's a real low growing plant but it has white pollen now look at the back leg of this bee it's got white pollen packed on that back leg bees have something called pollinator fidelity and that means when they start their day they stick with the same one species of plant all day long. So the pollen on their body is gonna be one species per bee. These two bees that probably came out of the same hive made different choices. They chose to go telegraph weed for that bee and then uh, California croton for the one on the right and they stuck with it all day. And you can tell they only have one color pollen on each of their bodies. So it's pretty easy to track back and figure out, okay, what is this bee? If you see a bee, you could tell probably what it's been gathering pollen from. All right, there's only one species of bee in the whole world that nests in little white boxes. There's only one, there's 20,000 species of bees, only one nests in little white boxes like these. All right, now the average person's perception of bees is based on a really small sample size. 20,000 species, 20,000 species, right? North America, we have 4,000 uh, apis species, all the old world bees, there's seven species, all other bees, that leaves 19,993 species, making it into a pie chart right here. Here is, here are the apis bees, which is, European bee is one of those, and all other bees is the rest of this pie chart. So to base knowledge about bees on one species, which is a member of a genus of seven species, as opposed to 19,993 bee uh, species. Wow, not a big sample size. 
So let's talk about some of the other ways bees live and not just apis, because you already know that one. Okay. All right. Well, are bees in trouble? That's a common question. Um, the answer is yes. Yes, they are. They're in really big trouble. We have altered the environment terribly and made it not conducive for bees. There's uh, an interesting idea. It's called bee washing. Bee washing instead of brainwashing. The fallacious idea that keeping or helping European honeybees will help the bees. Very often on social media, you'll see a post. Oh, I'm helping bees. I put in a beehive. No, you're not. You're not helping bees. Let's look at this way. The California condor is endangered. All right, let's say you want to help it. And the way you decide to help it is to keep chickens. And you're saying, I'm helping the California condor because I'm keeping chickens. Wow. No, not at all. Okay. Most bees nest in the ground like this. That's how bees nest. The female digs a, a hole in the ground. Most bees do this. They're solitary and they nest in the ground. On some of these bees, the nest they make is a meter deep. The deepest I know is four meters deep. Pretty amazing, huh? Okay, here are some in Santiago Canyon Road. I'm driving through. This is right at the corner of Santiago Canyon Road and Majesca Road, not the grade road that goes on the steep hill. It's the flat Majesca Road. And there's some glass in here and there's trash there. And I'm, I think I'm using knee pads because there's so much trash on this corner. But yet, look at all these holes. These are all bee nests. There's a bee right in the middle of the screen right there. And there's a little funny, it almost looks like, like the entrance to a, um, what do they call those ice houses or, or, a, or a storm porch. They go in through here and then go in and it goes straight down. Some have that little porch and some don't. There are two species nesting right here, right next to the road. I'm literally meter and a half away from pavement. And it's this bee right here. It's Melisodes. This is one of our most common ground nesting bees. On the left is a male that I photographed over at Bolsa Chica. You can see he's got really long antennae and he's not very big. That's the male of the one on the right. The one on the right is a female and she's about to go into her hole up there at the top. I was laying down photographing her and she'd land and move and run underground and come out, fly away, then come back. And I was laying there for a while. And finally she came back and she stopped. And that's when I got the shot because she would not stay still. That's a common ground nesting bee. They're really fuzzy, real beautiful little things. And here's the drawing of one species of bee in the ground. They make that tunnel, it goes down and then it branches off and they make these little chambers at the end and they fill the chamber with pollen. They'll collect pollen, get back to the nest, chew it up, mix it with saliva, spit it out, form a ball, or in this case, fill the chamber. And then she lays one egg with that pollen and then moves on to the next. In some species, she'll fill it in with soil, like in this drawing, but in other species, she'll leave the thing completely open. And this is a very common nest arrangement for ground nesting solitary bees. Looks just like this. Okay, so how do you how do you promote this? How would you promote this? Well, you don't want your garden or any other area covered in mulch. So you want to clear vegetation away from a sunny, well-drained spot. This bee likes to nest on a bit of a slope, some like a flat area, it varies. Select a site in an open south facing slope, that's a good place. Leave some plants nearby to prevent erosion, but just have some cleared area. They need clear soil. Only bumblebees will tunnel under leaf litter. All the other bees want clear soil to nest in. And don't turn the soil. So once I learned that, I was turning the soil because that's how I was taught to garden. You always turn the soil and then you plant. Once I realized, oh my gosh, I'm killing my soil organisms by turning the soil too often and I could kill my bees. So 
when I plant something, I just make a hole for that plant. I don't turn all the soil near it. I just turn, I just, just do it for that hole and realize that bees need stable soil to nest. If it's really super sandy that can fall in on it, then they won't put a nest there. They need a little bit of structure. And then here is the average leaf cutter bee life cycle. We can start with the adult here on the top. And so the adult will go into uh, kind of a tubular area. It can be under bark. It can be in a bark beetle hole. And in fact, in agriculture, they raise these on purpose in boxes of straws. They literally will buy boxes of straws, tear the top off, and they'll get the straws that aren't packed in paper. You just That exposes the straw, tilt it on its side, and they stack them up in a semi-truck. And I've been in Bakersfield area and seen this myself. And the bees will come in, the leafcutter bees will nest in those straws. And now they've got a truck full of these straws. They'll leave them there to pollinate because they're really effective pollinators. They'll leave them there to pollinate the plants in that area. And then once they've reproduced, they've got their young going in these chambers, they'll actually drop the sides on the trucks and drive the truck to the next spot or an area where they can spend the winter and be dormant. It's pretty wild. So they go into something like this. They will put, uh, make a pollen ball. They'll lay an egg. The egg hatches. There's a larva. It's bigger, bigger, pupates, emerges out, flies away. It's pretty cool. They'll actually go and cut little circular pieces of leaves off to make these chamber divisions here. That's what those divisions are made of. Here's a really common bee from the bay. That's where I photographed it, right there. San Joaquin Hills Drive at Back Bay Drive. There's a whole bunch of backers there. And uh, I was photographing it. This, oh, this one I photographed on Irvine Ranch Conservancy. Sorry, this species also lives in the bay. Let's see if I've got other photos. You can see it taking nectar there. This is my favorite bee. This is a male of the Agapostomon. This, this is called the Angelic Metallic Sweat Bee. Love that name. And you can see the male's got black and yellow banded abdomen beautiful metallic green head and thorax. What a fantastic looking bee. All right, here is a leaf cutter on a coastal golden bush at Irvine Regional Park. And you can see it doesn't have a little basket on the hind leg. It packs the pollen under its abdomen. It stops every once in a while to comb the pollen off, pack it under those stiff hairs, and then fly it back to their nest. This is the very one that made that nest I just showed you the drawing of. Where they pack in some leaves and uh, and pollen balls. This is it. This is a series of leaf cutter bees by Roger Renke. Some of you probably know Roger. He was a big name in the Back Bay way before the Moose Center was around. He photographed these in his backyard and let me use them. He noticed on Bougainvillea in his yard these circular, beautiful hole punch looking uh, leaf uh, holes, and so he knew what they were and he whipped whipped out his camera and he got a picture of here, the bee is cutting that hole. It's cutting these perfectly circular holes in his plant. And this one's just about to finish the last piece. So it's got the piece in it and it, it's starting to fly. That's why the wings aren't, aren't focused. Flying and then it clips the last piece. There we go, clips the last piece and flies away with it and packs it into its nest. And it typically leaves these wonderful round holes in leaves they especially like soft leaves of uh, redbud, circus, and also bougainvillea flowers, anything that's soft like that, they will go ahead and clip. So you can always tell if there's leaf cutters in an area because you'll see these perfectly round holes trimmed out of your plants, not causing the plant any grief, totally fine. Then here we have a bee that's on uh, manzanita. I photographed this at Rancho Santana Botanic Garden. I have not identified the bee yet. I think it's a, I think it's a Eucera bee. I think that's the genus of it, but I'm not sure. And then here are some shooting stars. Now shooting stars, no, not, <laughs> sorry, nightshade. Nightshade is related to tomatoes. You might recognize the flower structure. We have um, three purple ones locally that all blend together. They're actually considered one species. And uh, they go by a number of different common names, purple nightshade, blue nightshade, blue witch, all kinds of names. But here's one. 
And here's the structure of the flower. The, the stamen, the anther, excuse me, face downward and they have an opening in the tip. That tip does not open until a bee, only some kinds of bees can open it up by a process we're gonna go over here in just a minute. Here's a drawing of a bee on one of those flowers. The bee has to land upside down. And the stigma, let's look at the drawing at the far left, sorry, picture at the far left, see the green stigma that hits the belly of the bee, it's touching the belly of the bee. If the bee already has pollen on it, the pollen gets transferred, boom, that's pollination. The pollen tube grows through the middle, fertilizes the ovules, there we go. So on the far right, here's a bee holding on, grasping the anthers with its legs, and we've got little shiver marks on the drawing. So here's what the bee does. First off, you have to know that insects fly not with wings that have muscles attached to them like mammals, nope, and birds. They have muscles that flex the shape of the abdomen that goes like this. Muscles are inside. The wings are an outgrowth of the body. They're not connected to muscles. The only way they can flap wings is by changing the shape of that thorax and that causes the flapping motion. Well, they're able to stop flapping. They can still, they can still shiver those muscles without flapping the wings, right? They can vibrate. And that's what we call this. This, term, this uh, form of pollination you're gonna see is vibratile pollination or buzz pollination. And the bee vibrates and the vibration is sent into the, the anther, this part here, this yellow that we see. And that, that gets the inside of the anther moving, it's shaking and it sets up kind of a harmonic inside of the anther, which is hollow and full of pollen. Also inside the anther, there are little hairs that go in. And it turns out to be a situation just like Chinese pinball. Remember those pinball machines way back when? So it sets that up and the pollen starts bouncing around inside. Do, 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 do. The energy level goes higher and higher and higher, more and more and more and more and more buzzing until finally the pollen bursts through the tip of the anther and slams into the bee and just shoots the bee with pollen. The pollen travels at a measured force. It hits the bee with a force that's been measured at 25 times the force of gravity. Right now you're experiencing one G, the bee experiences 25 Gs when all that pollen hits them. That's pretty impressive and it doesn't hurt the bee. So it gets pollen on it. Now the bee uses the legs, combs the pollen from the belly, puts it in that basket on the hind leg and travels on but now it's got pollen all over it. So the next flower it flies to, the stigma of another flower sticks to the pollen on its belly, boom, we have pollen transfer, that's pollination. That's how it happens. Not all bees can disconnect the flight muscles from the, from the wings, basically. Not all bees can do it. European bees cannot do that. They cannot do it. They cannot pollinate nightshade. They cannot pollinate its relative tomato. They cannot pollinate eggplant. There's all kinds of things that European bees cannot pollinate because they cannot disconnect the wings from the flight muscles. They can't separate those motions. Only some bees can do that. So here's a drawing of a bee on one of these, and it sets up that vibration and opens up the end of that anther and shoots out. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I shot a little video showing you how this works with a real live nightshade? So I set this up. It's really quick and dirty, informal shot I did in my kitchen where I got a tuning fork in the key of C, which is what you need because it turns out the vibration they set up, the harmonic, is a middle C. And so you just get a, a C tuning fork Bing, get it going and put it on the anther and it simulates the activity of a bee that can do buzz pollination. So watch up. And you can even hear the buzz from the, from the uh, tuning fork do that. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> really happy with that one. If we were in person, thank you, Rita. If we were in person, I would bring a tuning fork and the flowers and let you do it. That's how I normally do this part, but eh, COVID. 
It's a really easy thing to do. You can either find the plants in the wild or you go to Tree Life Nursery, they sell the plants. So I usually go buy a plant from them and bring it to my presentation. And I have a handful of tuning forks. It's gotta be the key of C, that's what works the best. Bob, I got a question come in um, that was, is nightshade poisonous? And if so, is the bee immune to it? Okay, the question of nightshade being poisonous is a more involved one. They do have an alkaloid toxin in them. And if you eat more, you know, if you eat more than just a few of, uh, of the fruits of nightshade, yeah, you'll probably get sick. My good friend, Oscar Clark, some of you may know who that was, uh, used to eat them. And I thought he was crazy. I would never show naturalists or the public that you can eat nightshade berries, but he would just pop a few in his mouth. I think it's a bad practice. So yes, it is poisonous. Um, the bees don't eat the, um, the sap, so they're fine. There's no poison in the pollen, so the bees are totally fine. But, but yeah, nightshade is, is poisonous, but it's a dosage thing. And also bees, no, they're not gonna encounter it. Okay, this is a European bee on Manzanita and European bees do not buzz pollinate. The only way they can get anything from a, a manzanita flower is by waiting for a bee that does buzz pollinate to go there, buzz, and that opens up the anthers. Now it dumps the pollen, but this bee's not after pollen, this bee's after nectar. So once the nectar starts flowing from a manzanita, it, it makes its way to the opening of the flower and any critter can lick up that pollen, or that, sorry, that nectar. An insect that visits a flower and takes without being part of pollination services is called a nectar thief. So this bee is being a nectar thief, All right? All right, monkey flowers. Oh, who doesn't love monkey flowers? Oh my gosh. Now monkey flowers are pollinated by hummingbirds. They're hummingbird pollinated. You can see in the flower here, you've got the stigma is looks like a a catcher's mitt, the two parts, and the stamens and anthers are right behind it. So hummingbird puts its bill in. If it already has pollen from a, a visit to a prior flower, it sticks to that stigma and the stigma closes. Some of you, if you lead nature walks, you might use something to tickle that and it closes. It's a fun little thing to do, All right? So it closes. If it detects that the pollen is the same species, it's a chemical recognition thing, then it closes. Pollen tubes grow, sperm cells travel to the ovule, fertilizes it, you have seed set, all right? Meanwhile, the, the hummingbird puts its bill in farther and farther, and it's really after nectar, it's not after pollen. Hummingbirds don't use pollen. So it's gonna put its tongue in to the nectary inside. Meanwhile, it gets pollen on its bill, and when it takes the bill back out, it gets more pollen on the top of the bill, and then when they go to the next flower, they transfer the pollen like in the top diagram of this three-step diagram. Okay, I see something in chat. I kind of missed it there for a minute. Let me see if I missed something. Oh, okay. Does the Ceanothus moth pollinate any Ceanothus? Ceanothus silk moth pollinates nothing. They have no mouth. They don't visit flowers. They have no mouth. That's a trait of the giant silk moth family, the Saturniidae. They have no mouth parts as adults. They just live to reproduce, lay eggs, and that's it. That's why they don't live very long. Okay, I'm gonna close the chat then. All right, on to something else. Here are some local monkey flowers. We have the, the hairy bush monkey flower, top right, that's a kind of a yellowy orange one that is primarily um, hummingbird pollinated. And here is a painting I had my friend David Sibley do for me with an Allen's hummingbird, <laughs> Allen, get it? The best hummingbird on hairy bush monkey flower that I have seen in the Chino Hills. This monkey flower doesn't live in our lowlands. This is a high elevation monkey flower. I've only seen it pollinate these flowers or visit these flowers. I've never been able to photograph it. Every time I see these guys doing this, I don't have a camera with me. So as you can see, that's what it looks like, All right? And again, Bill goes in, transfers some pollen, Bill goes, gets, picks up more pollen, Bill goes out, transfers pollen to the next flower. 
okay, how do you how do you attract them and garden for pollinators? Oh, that's pretty easy to do. Well, you got to know what attracts them. Visual, so good colors, scent, or both. It depends on the pollinator. You've got to meet their needs, whatever they need. We have the four basic needs, food. You got to provide food for them so they'll come in. You need to provide water for them because yes, bees, butterflies, moths, flies, they all drink water too. So they do need a source of water. They need shelter and space. And that's the other thing you provide. Shelter and space would just include providing plants that they can use to live in. And then once they, the critters show up, then they need to find mates for reproduction to establish a colony somewhere near your area. Okay, now realize that most life on earth is smaller than your finger, all right? To see most pollinators, you really need to look. That's why using binoculars is a good idea. Using a camera, especially with a zoom lens is a good idea. Then you can really see them. We're just too darn big. Most pollinators are you know, like that. They're a little, really small compared to us. So I recommend these binoculars. These are very close focusing binoculars specifically made to look at things close up like butterflies, bees, flies, but not be right in their face. They do zoom, they do go to infinity, but you can be really close to them. They're really, really outstanding binoculars. Yeah, they're about 150 bucks. Excuse me, but they're built very well, and a lot of people use these. They're a really great binoc. Okay, there's really two approaches to gardening and landscape. As I call it, there's sterile garden, the sterile garden approach, and there's the naturalistic garden approach. Sterile garden has non-native plants. Go to any shopping center, and they're usually sterile, and there's nothing on them, not a thing. Naturalistic garden is made with native plants. Sterile garden has non-native plants with non-native pests. Did you know that most pests, nearly all garden pests are non-native? Nearly all the pests that farmers deal with are non-native, nearly all. They shouldn't be here. They got in accidentally and they're a huge problem. We're in a naturalistic garden with native plants. Native plants have very few things that are pests. Sterile garden, people often use pesticides. The pesticides kill everything. There's no such thing as a pesticide that kills the bad bugs and lets the good ones live. No such thing. So in a naturalistic garden, you don't use pesticides. So in my garden, which is all California natives, I have insects year round, lizards year round, birds year round, uh, not so much in the mammal department. All right, in sterile garden, there's mindless maintenance, weeding, deadheading, and then the gardeners, the untrained gardeners that like to mow, blow, and go, they don't care what they're doing. They just want to get it done, get back in the truck and leave. They have no knowledge and no tie to the plants, really. We're in a native garden. Yeah, of course you got to do maintenance because that's the fun part of gardening is getting outside and doing that and getting to know your plants. We don't mow, blow, and go. We stay. Really sterile garden, there's no connection to the land. And the people that take care of those gardens, they don't really care. They just want to get out of there. Where in a naturalistic garden, it's a strong connection to the land. You're working with native plants, which bring in native insects, it's a, which bring in native birds and lizards. And that is a stronger tie to that garden. And sterile gardens are not used by other life forms. They're not. They're just sterile. They don't provide habitat and therefore no biodiversity. Where in a native garden, or naturalistic garden, it's used by other life forms. It provides habitat and therefore is biodiversity, which as we all know, there's a biodiversity crisis going on and we need to do everything we can to promote more species. I think there's something in the chat. I'm gonna see if it's new. What's the biggest deterrent to pollinators, Monsanto? <laughs> biggest deterrent to pollinators is habitat loss. Habitat loss, yep. In places where like they have sterile gardens where they rake up all the leaves all the time, that eliminates habitat for lots of things. You don't want to do that. Why would you rake up a bunch of leaves? That's free fertilizer. And it keeps the moisture in for the plants that are there so they don't dry out as easily. And they decompose, they provide habitat for living things, right? Leaves are great. But I know some people live in homeowner associations 
that have really draconian rules that don't allow you to have leaves on the ground. Ooh. Okay. Oh, let's see, the leaf cutters were cutting red bougainvillea. Yes, they were. Uh, are the binox good for distance? Oh, binox, good for distance. Yes, they focus to infinity. They're little small ones, so I wouldn't use it for regular bird, you know, birding at a distance, but they're great for close up. They do focus to infinity though. Okay, can they see red? Um, can they see red? I don't know who they is. Bees cannot see red. No, they see red as black, if that's what you're asking. Everything else can see red. Okay, moving on. All right, there's this wonderful magazine, the California Native Plant Society, with which I'm really active, puts out two publications. One is a technical publication called Fremontia, and the other is more for the general public, but it's so good. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. Um, this is called Flora Magazine, and I was interviewed for Flora Magazine, and here is the article. It wasn't real long, and they wanted some pictures of some local insects that use native plants, and these were mostly photographed in my yard, all right? The uh, Red Admiral I photographed in the Santa Ana Mountains, and that beautiful caterpillar there feeding on my native California grapes, and there's the adult moth from that caterpillar. What a beauty. And then there's a native grasshopper on buckwheat. Here's a native tree cricket on my oak tree in the front yard. Here's another native grasshopper on a desert brittle bush. It's uh, really just really nice. And then a nice bumblebee on some deer weed up here. So the article talks about how to promote all of these things. It's a pretty good little article, if I do say so myself. What do you think of recent reports of global insect decline? Um, there is data to support that. Anytime there's data, you got to pay attention. The data, a lot of data is showing that in, well, first off, how do we gather the data on what's here and what's not? You got to rely on entomologists. You got to look at how they do surveys for things. And one of the biggest ways we do that is a general purpose insect trap called a malaise trap. And that's what the initial studies in Germany, really long-term studies they're doing, they run a malaise trap and anything flying by runs into this trap, kind of looks like a tent, kind of. They get caught in this thing and then we, we collect them and we identify them and we look at how many species, what species, how many of each individual. And through the years, those numbers in malaise traps have been dropping and dropping and dropping. Those, that, that study in Germany has been compared to other studies on the planet and all of them have the same results that there's fewer and fewer at these malaise trap installations. Now, is that the only source of that data? No, we do black lighting at night. We go out with a net during the day. We put pieces of canvas on a frame and tap a branch and see what falls off. We're just seeing the same thing happen over and over again in these reports that people are finding fewer species. Well, it makes sense. If we wipe out a habitat, you're going to wipe out the insects that are there too. What's my opinion of neonicotinoids? It looks like neonicotinoids are a completely evil thing. They kill everything, absolutely everything. That's why farmers love them because they are a fantastic pesticide. They kill everything. Right now we're seeing that, wow, they're, they, what if, you know, what happens if a bee gets to that? Well, it, it they kill bees, all right? So looks like that was probably not a good choice. I'm not involved in all of that in evaluating pesticides and I'm not a chemist. So I can't really get into it. I've not read the data, but I do know there is data that link that neonicotinoids, which are a class of insecticides that are similar to nicotine that kill a lot of insects. They're killing a lot of non-target insects and so really we need to take a look at that and see if maybe those need to go away. Could be. Uh, we don't have enough data right now. We need, we need more data. Okay, how can I support native insects in my garden? Well, use locally native plants because they provide food and shelter for those native insects. Eliminate pesticides. You don't need to use pesticides in a home garden. You really don't. Okay, whoops. I click before I should have, sorry. Reduce garden disturbance. Yeah, you don't need to be out there hacking away at your garden and uh, being OCD and pruning things too much. Don't do that. Take it easy because you're removing habitat. You're stepping on things when you do that. 
Uh, mulch covers the ground. A lot of people like mulch because it controls weeds, but also it blocks bees access to soil where they need to nest. Okay, I'm looking to see, I think something came in. I spend time attracting birds. Am I decimating the insects? Uh, no, no, you're bringing birds in and um, the insects, some insects feed on bird poop, all right? Um, no, I don't see that as a problem. Yes, so some of those birds are coming in feeding on the insects in your garden and that's the great circle of life right there. So I attract birds too. I'm also a birder and I like them all. And we need to change human notions about native insects. A lot of people think bug equals bad. It's really a shame. They really do think that. Okay, here's my top pollinator plants. So you wanna bring in pollinators. These are the plants you gotta have. Buckwheats, manzanitas, coast golden bush, California lilacs, baccarus, California poppy, sages, beard tongues, monkey flowers, milkweeds, verbena, and all kinds of annual wildflowers. These are fantastic things to have in any garden and you really should have them. And that will do me for the evening. Thank you for coming. And we can open it up for questions here. I'll stop my share and we'll go back to Zoom. There we go. Anyone have any questions or comments at this point? You can unmute and talk too. Oh, Jack, that's a nice yucca behind you. That's a great shot. Bob, you, you have um, said, I think it was you that said you can plant uh, wild roses, but they'll never bloom. No, it wasn't me that said that. Um, I have seen people's plantings of wild roses bloom. Oh, okay. I, I wouldn't plant wild rose though, because they, they reproduce underground and they spread and they're very hard to control. So if I put those in, I'd put them in a pot. Thank you. Yeah. You can I'll see it at San, Joaquin, <laughs> at San Joaquin Wildlife Sanctuary. They planted them in many places and they've spread along the paths. Yeah. And they're, they're really beautiful, but uh, they're really hard to control. Okay. Oh, thank you, everybody. That's very nice of you. Any other questions or comments or just want to say hi? I see Lori Whalen's here. I haven't heard from her. You did a great job. Oh, I learned a lot. Thank you, Fran. I sometimes think I know a lot, and then I find that somebody like you talks about things, and I learn so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I go to these talks, too. I always learn stuff. And I, Bob, I think you, you, um, you mentioned some time ago that there, there's, there are some cases of insects that kind of intentionally pollinate rather than accidentally. Yeah, there's very few ones that, that purposely pollinate. And that would be the things Peter and I were up photographing. And that's the yucca moths. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think somebody asked me a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I know you know what that, what that moth is thinking when it's doing that. Yeah, it's one of the very few things that actually does intentional pollination. It grabs the mass of pollen and sticks it on the stigma and lays eggs in the ovary. That's a wild moth. It's really a bizarre moth. So it, it's doing that because it benefits its own reproductive. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, it's one of the few, one of the few that does that. Most everything is just incidental, but that increases the success of its reproduction. And so that behavior benefits them. That's why when we're planting them, we make sure to plant them in pairs also. Yeah, that's always a good idea to ensure cross-pollination. Yeah, that's always a good idea. Uh, Lori was asking, is it true that hybrids and cultivars are less effective for pollinating insects? There is no data to support that. No data. Um, if you are doing restoration in a natural area, then you should use true species and not hybrids or cultivars. But in a garden situation, I don't see that as a problem. The only time it's a problem when you have um, a cultivar hybrid is when you're near a natural area and the plant you're putting in is in the plant. Sycamores are the best. Sycamores are the best. Sycamores are the best. Sycamores are the best. Once we plant the long street, that's actually a hybrid from you. It's pollen hits the air. Pollen hits the air. It's known to land on the stigma of California sycamores and produce hybrid offspring that are then grafted onto the plant. Yeah, that's a good point. 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 Ye
growing in wild areas. We've detected these hybrids in the Sacramento River Valley and right here in San Diego Creek in Irvine. Both of those things are happening. So that, that hybrid from Europe is causing some problems. Walnuts do the same thing. Walnuts are largely uh, wind pollinated too. And ash trees are wind pollinated. So these things are, are the ones that are the problems. It leads to a lot of hybridization. Oaks hybridize too. That's the only stuff that, those are the only ones I know of that do have data. Oh, someone has more than one device going, too much feedback, can't hear me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, your your mic was doing something very strange in the middle of that, but oh, no. then it came back, oh. so it's it's good now. Huh. Okay, well, I'm going to have to trace my connections because it was wigging out on me earlier, too. I use a really expensive pro mic, so that's kind of disturbing that there's something wrong with it. Are there any success stories with insects recovering? Uh, well, not too many, not too many, because we need to do it on a broader basis. What we really need to do is do what Doug Tallamy said. If you've read any of his, Doug Tallamy is a professor on the East Coast, and he came up with an idea that is so brilliant, it needs to be, uh, needs to be put into law. If we start planting native plants in all of our yards, it doesn't have to be 100% native in your yard. Include natives. Picture this. Santa Ana Mountains are right here. And if you've got people's homes that have native plants, the native insects can then come through and use those plants, and the birds, and the lizards, can use those native plants. And picture that these yards with native plants as being an extension of the national forest up there, going through our cities to the coast and on up, we could actually make what Doug has termed the American National Park, turn it into basically a continuous habitat through all of our yards. And it's a slam dunk, easy thing to do. Go plant some native plants in your yard. Super easy, it's brilliant. He, he, he has the details in his books. Bringing Nature Home is one of his books. He's written another recently that I haven't read yet, uh, but he, he outlines all that. He's done some really brilliant stuff. He has actually done great studies on insects in yards on the East Coast. He came out and he spoke at the California Native Plant Society's conference a couple of years ago and uh, really did a great job. Plant Amorpha, yes, plant some Amorpha. That is uh, false indigo bush that our native state butterfly, the California dog face lives on. And you can go to the plants in the wild and you can find the caterpillars and man, are they pretty caterpillars. I've raised them before. I've found the caterpillars and raised them and photographed them. They're really beautiful. Yeah. And I think there are historical records of, of, of that plant and the butterfly down in the lowland areas of Orange County, where we don't find them anymore. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, yeah, I grew up in San Juan Capistrano, and San Juan Creek has amorpha growing along it. At least it did when I was a kid. And we'd have the butterflies are everywhere. A California dogface is a really common butterfly. Now, don't confuse it with the Senna sulfur. That's even bigger and yellow. They've invaded here from Mexico. They're not actually native here, and they feed on non-native food plants that people plant in their yards and around, all right? Like uh, you, can, you can find the caterpillars on the, on the Senna plants in the parking lot at Walmart in Laguna Niguel. That's where I get the caterpillars. Not far from Peter's house, yeah. right over the hill, Peter. Yep, and Linnell and I have collected the caterpillars from those plants in the Walmart parking lot in Laguna Niguel and raised them. But our native butterfly only feeds on amorpha or false indigo. And there's two species and Tree Life Nursery does sell those plants. You can plant them. Okay, any other questions, folks? Thanks, Bob. It looks like no. Thank you. Where'd so Hillary go? Much, Bob, I'm here. Thank you so much oh, for being is. here tonight. Um, sure, you're welcome. Thank you for being here and, and enjoying Bob's talk. Um, I personally learned a ton, so I'm sure everyone else did as well. Um, I wanted to make sure everyone that's still here knows we will be back next month with Naturalist Night. 
Um, next month's program will be on the Irvine Laguna Wildlife Corridor. So we have a panel of three different speakers from that project who will be talking to us about what the corridor is, um, some issues they're facing, some solutions. Um, so that will be a month from today. It'll be Thursday, April 8th at 6 p.m. And information should be up on Eventbrite um, probably by tomorrow um, about that program. Um, I will also send you a follow-up email with uh, a couple of the links that Bob had in his presentation um, for resources. And um, if you would like to revisit this presentation um, or see some of our other content, we will be posting the recording on our YouTube channel. It should be up in about two weeks. Um, you can go to youtube.com slash Newport Bay Conservancy and find it there. And if you subscribe, you'll be the first to know when it gets posted. So thank you again. Thank you, Bob, for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. And have a good night, everyone. All right, you're very welcome. Take care. Thank hey, you. Don Millar's here. Yay, Don. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Bob.